We keep hearing from utilities that it's too expensive to transition to electrification and it's just not possible and that gas is safe and they really are sidestepping the facts and the evidence and the science that gas is harmful and that it is incredibly unhealthy for us to be breathing. Welcome to Climate Check, stories and solutions for fighting climate change. We are part of 350 Brooklyn, an organization that strives to counter the climate crisis through local action. We work towards a world that is just, equitable, and sustainable, and where all beings can thrive. I'm Eva Dean, she, her, your host of Climate Check. I'm a climate activist and a Brooklyn-based choreographer. On today's episode, we're discussing New York Heat and the recent victory to stop National Grid from using public money to fund fossil fuel infrastructure in Brooklyn. Our guest is Megan Burton, Senior Attorney at Earth Justice. Megan represents communities and environmental groups in utility rate cases in New York State and works to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and the use of gas in New York buildings in particular. Hi, Megan. Welcome. Hi. How are you? It's so good to be here. Would you mind introducing yourself with your pronouns? Of course. Um, My name is Megan Burton, and I use she, her pronouns. Can you tell us a bit about your climate story and how you went from being a public defender to an earth defender? I went to law school really to be a public defender. I really wanted to help folks, to be an advocate for them, and to provide a voice to folks who were not being heard or were not being helped. And as a public defender, I was working in Boston as well as the South Shore in Massachusetts. A common theme among almost all of my clients was that their communities were all too often victims of environmental harms and pollutions. And this really impacted, you know, their livelihood, their mental health, as well as their physical health. Whether it was air pollution, water pollution, being next to a bus depot or a landfill, and it was really heartbreaking as to what folks were exposed to and the horrible health impact. What I was seeing, at least with my clients, is that I felt as though the fossil fuel infrastructure and those companies were some of the biggest, if you will, culprits really impacting communities' lives. And so I made the decision to really just dive headfirst into the world of the energy regulatory sector in New York, rolled up my sleeves and tried to really understand, process, figure out where the holes and the gaps and the loopholes were that were enabling fossil fuel infrastructure from expanding their business practices. Could you tell us a bit about your mission at Earth Justice? Our mission really is to make sure and to prioritize that the Earth has a good lawyer. So we are out there fighting every angle, whether that is to protect the public lands and wildlife, to ensure that our tribal partners, that their land and the things that are most valuable to indigenous communities are protected. We're out there protecting the oceans and also really fighting for the closure of petrochemicals, coal plants, and fossil fuel infrastructure, and really wanting to transition to a safe, healthy, decarbonized electric future. And we work with an incredible team of attorneys and staff and scientists and are part of some incredible, brilliant coalitions. And I just feel so privileged that I get to work here every day. And then we have a wonderful fundraising team that helps us bring resources into the organization so that we can represent almost all of our clients pro bono, so at no cost. What do you do on a daily basis? One thing I love about the job is that my days, every day is different. So yes, there may be some days that I am 
knee deep in writing, writing, writing for a week for a legal brief or an appeal. There's other days when I am lobbying and speaking with city or state legislators or even federal legislators, joining a lot of coalition calls, doing teach-ins, mentoring junior attorneys, junior staff, and then also doing a lot of research myself. The environmental space, the clean energy space is, you know, moving rapidly. There's always new technology that I need to get a handle on. I also speak a lot with our colleagues out west in California who has also done some pretty impressive work combating climate change and ensuring and protecting the air that folks breathe. So really trying to learn from them as well. So I'm really doing a little bit of everything. This is a great time for us to dive into the heart of today's topic. Can you tell us what Earth Justice is currently working on in New York Heat? What is New York Heat? Yeah, so that's an excellent question because I don't know if a lot of folks know about that bill. New York Heat stands for New York Home Energy and Affordable Transition Act. It is a little complicated and I want to break it down for you. So New York Heat Act is critical legislation really for two reasons. The first is that it phases out the harmful, unsafe, and expensive practice of gas line extension allowances. And I'll explain that in one second. And it also gives the Public Service Commission, which regulates utilities in New York, the power to keep gas companies and gas utilities in line with our climate law and reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. That is so important, that the rate payers, the public, does not have to pay for infrastructure for fossil fuels. So sorry to interrupt you. Can you go back to New York Heat? It's an excellent point, and that's really what this bill is getting at. So just for a little bit of background, For decades, gas companies have covered the cost of connecting new customers to the gas system with a subsidy, and this is often referred to as the 100-foot rule. So it's a subsidy from New York State? It's actually a subsidy that all existing gas ratepayers pay. And so this subsidy, which is called the 100-foot rule, is a form of a cross-subsidy for new residential ratepayers who do not pay a thing. They don't pay a cost of being connected to a new gas line within 100 feet. And this new cost for the new connection is added on top of all other capital costs, and that cost is shifted onto existing ratepayers, meaning that we are all paying for that. And just to give folks an idea as to how much money we really are talking about, On average and on an annual basis, these gas extension allowances cost New Yorkers about $200 million a year. Oh boy, we could really use that money to build infrastructure. And National Grid, naming names, are they a for-profit company? They are. So the ratepayers are paying for public infrastructure of a private company. What's wrong with this picture? It's really, so this subsidy is a, is a powerful incentive and tool. That I have utility. a hard time with the word subsidy. The, so it's the rate payers. Paid. It's, the, it's the rate payers. But this, this is what. This is what NYC, they call it. Yes, this is Natural what they call gas. it. Natural gas. Sorry. Yes. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Shut this up, Emma. <laughs> I'm not arguing with you. I'm just upset. Yes, I, I mean, it, because it's upsetting. And this is this is what has enabled gas utilities and companies to completely expand their infrastructure all on the backs of us. And we will be on the hook for the cost of the fossil fuel, natural gas infrastructure for decades, even though we know that this infrastructure and that gas is bad for the climate, bad for our health, and incredibly expensive. So New York Heat empowers who? The Public Service Commission to, can you tell us more about that? 
there's actually a couple of points. So the NY Heat Act will empower the Public Service Commission to actually act, meaning that they will force the gas utilities and the electric utilities to comply with our climate law to help meet or ensure that New York will meet its climate mandates in 2030, 2040, and 2050. And the NY Heat Act will also help us with our transition to electrification. And it will also, it has one pretty incredible thing in it, is that it puts a cap so that New York families will not be paying more than 6% of their household income towards their energy bills, which is huge. That's huge in terms of climate justice. It is. We, I mean, families are already struggling with rising costs and rising utility bills. And if we continue down this road of expanding, expanding, expanding fossil fuel infrastructure, our rates are going to be going up astronomically. They are pushing for almost a 32% rate increase. Oh my goodness. A 12% increase on your electricity and a 20% increase in your gas. And that increase in this proposal doesn't have really any meaningful programs or targets for electrification. So this cost that ratepayers, that they're shifting onto ratepayers, this is just to maintain the system. That's not even a step in the right direction towards reducing our emissions, towards improving indoor health and outdoor air quality. It's just the same old business as usual, but shifting higher costs onto ratepayers. How are they justifying this? You know, it's interesting because we keep hearing from utilities and front groups such as New Yorkers for Affordable Energy that, you know, spreading misinformation and really engaging in some ridiculous scare tactics and fear mongering that it's too expensive to transition to electrification and it's just not possible and that gas is safe. And they really are sidestepping the facts and the evidence and the science that gas is harmful and that it is incredibly unhealthy for us to be breathing, especially for New Yorkers that live, New York City is a dense city with tons of people living in apartments who don't necessarily have excellent or good quality ventilation. And so every time we turn on that stove, gas stove, gas stove. not so natural gas stove, yes. they're brilliant at the wording of things. They really are. They, I mean, and it's intentional. And, you know, our partners, the Building Decarbonization Coalition, recently released a brilliant report called The New York Future of Gas. And there were some interesting facts about how we came here and what the utilities are capable of doing when it's in their business interest and what they say when they don't really want to do what's in the best interest for their customers. Because they're looking to make a profit. Exactly. Exactly. It's it's money before public health. So I'm really glad that New York Heat has a component to it where the Public Service Commission, also known as PSC, has the ability to legally make the utilities comply. Exactly. And really downsizing the gas system as opposed to expanding it. And we know that there is going to be a little bit of time for a couple of years that this transition that we're talking about towards electrification, well, let's really be intentional about that transition. Let's be investing in electrification. Let's be making it more affordable and accessible and equitable so that folks aren't left behind and it's only the wealthy who can afford to have a heat pump and an induction stove. I recently read an article which I found fascinating that between 1950 and 1960, there was only about... 700,000 natural gas customers in New York State. And in that 10 years, utilities did a massive outreach and were able to switch their customers onto natural gas and an increase to 3.7 million gas users in 10 years. And Con Edison and Brooklyn Union Gas 
mobilized over 3,000 of their own technicians to convert each of their 925,000 customers, and they handed out 2 million appliances for natural gas. So we can do this again, but electrify. Exactly. We need to get them on board. get back to New York Heat. I want to make sure that you've been able to talk about all of the aspects of New York Heat. New York Heat also mentions and references the Thermal Energy Networks and Jobs Act that passed last year. And that bill is the first of its kind, the first in the nation. And it really requires all of the utilities in New York State to come up with various proposals for thermal energy networks that they can roll out in their service territory and explain how many new jobs that this will bring. And so we want to ensure that our future with electrification is safe, healthy, and affordable. And that affordability also includes access to livable wages. And that's what New York Heat is helping to achieve. I can envision how that happens in upstate New York because there is more land. How would that work in New York City? That's an excellent question, and that's one reason why we are asking utilities to really think out of the box and think creatively as, like, is there a neighborhood where the infrastructure below the ground is near retirement or needs additional repair. And maybe we should retire and decommission that section of the gas system and transition it into a thermal energy network. And there's a lot of buildings already that are in New York City that are running on heat pumps that we just aren't aware of. And so we really want to explore that opportunity. We want to have the utilities be committed and having there be benchmarks for outreach and education so that New Yorkers know what their options are before being signed up unknowingly to future decades of fossil fuel infrastructure. So right-sizing also applies to right-sizing for green infrastructure, if I understand this correctly, that we need pipes for the thermal energy networks. Yes. So the people who work with pipes, I don't know if they have an official title, do they? They do. They're often called the pipe fitters. Okay. And there's a union for them. And, you know, working with trade groups and unions and electricians, they're the, they're the folks who are already putting the pipes in the ground for fracked gas. Okay, And so, so it's I, a perfect transition it and is. a perfect job opportunity. Yeah. And there's going to be tons of new construction, electrification. We need electricians. And so really wanting to work with them and let them know that there's going to be tons of job opportunities. So these skilled pipe fitters are going to be so important in terms of this thermal energy network. Yes. Yes. Fabulous. Our listeners know now about the New York Public Service Commission, also known as PSC. And we have a very exciting, very recent win where PSC denied National Grid $70 million of public money. And now we know it's public money. It's ratepayers' money. We're all paying it for the liquefied natural gas gas plant in North Brooklyn. And you were a part of that, right? You know, I was part of that. And I was so lucky. And I was thrilled when we learned that information and listened to the hearing and when the PSC came down with their order. We were lucky enough to represent and work with Sane Energy Project, as well as the No North Brooklyn Pipeline Coalition. They've been fighting that fight for three years. And they were fighting the closure of the Williams Pipeline, the North Brooklyn Pipeline, as well as the expansion of this unnecessary LNG liquefied natural gas facility in Greenpoint. This coalition, these groups, I I like to always bring this up because it gives me hope. It's people power. It really is. Their voices were finally heard. Finally heard. And it takes three years. So you know, there are days where I read the paper and I'm down, quite down. 
and just to remember that it takes time. And were you surprised by this decision? I was honestly a little bit surprised, but also obviously relieved and felt like the Public Service Commission is finally getting it, is finally understanding the facts and sees that utilities are going to say anything to justify ratepayers to spend unnecessary large amounts of money. Like you said, $70 million is what National Grid was asking the commission to authorize. And when it came out through our comments, through our research, through our investigation, that this project wasn't even needed. And the Public Service Commission agreed. So they denied the project. I know I mentioned earlier we were working with Sane Energy Project, as well as the Alliance for a Green Economy. We were fortunate enough to hire an expert to submit a cumulative impact study that really analyzed what this LNG facility, this liquefied natural gas facility, how it would impact the surrounding community and what environmental and health burdens they were already suffering from. And, you know, I know that you and our listeners already know this, but the LNG vaporizers, the location of that is also the home to two Superfund sites, as well as other industrial facilities. And so you have to ask yourself, why would anyone authorize the permit or this high price tag for a project that would lead to increased environmental harm, such as, you know, indoor and outdoor air pollution, the communities already suffered or suffering or bearing the brunt of these past environmental harms, and the project isn't needed, and it's going to lead to increased emissions that doesn't comply with our New York climate law. It's just, it makes no sense. So we were thrilled, ecstatic that the commission did the right thing. What else are you working on right now? Two other projects that we're also working on and that we have worked on. We had another huge win in Astoria, which I'm not sure if you're aware of. And it was actually the perfect case where we represented, again, environmental justice groups, Um, New York City for Environmental Justice Alliance, and also worked with the Sierra Club and New York Lawyers for the Public Interest. And there was a petition, again, from fossil fuel industry to repower their power plant in Astoria, Queens. And they were making the argument that this was necessary, that it was clean, that it would be running more efficiently. You know, of course, they left out information that it would be running more frequently, therefore admitting more emissions. And they really weren't thinking outside of the box or really complying with our climate law of reducing the emissions and looking at renewable energy, such as battery storage and solar. So over the past two to three years, we've been fighting this fight and the New York State Department of Environmental Conservation denied the request for an air permit renewal. And what that means is that that power plant couldn't continue operation. And what was even better is that the owners of the Astoria generating plant sold their property to Beacon Wind, and it's going to become an interconnection site for offshore wind. And so that's exactly what we want. We want this transition to clean, renewable energy, and that the surrounding community can also partake in that and have a stake or opportunities with renewable energy that pay livable wages that is not going to lead to increase air pollution, to increase greenhouse gas emissions, and that the community is moving forward with this transition. This is an excellent example of how fracked gas infrastructure has now been turned into a green energy source. Exactly. Really, this is wonderful. I'm really happy to learn about this. Can you expand on the lobbying work that you do? How much are you working with legislators Yeah, so 
Actually, I meet with legislators weekly, and especially on the New York or NY Heat Act, we meet and talk regularly with coalition members as well as We Act for Environmental Justice, Alliance for a Green Economy, NRDC, and really helping all of us were there writing the legislation for the New York Heat Act. Some of my days during the week is educating and participating in meetings with regulators or legislators and doing a lot of education and teach-ins and really pushing back because we know that industry is having those meetings as well. And we want to like push back on that false information, that misleading information about costs, about what a realistic alternative is, which I know folks have heard about, you know, these false solutions such as hydrogen or renewable natural gas. And that's the not the, the direction that we need to be heading into that's just going to extend the life and our reliance on fossil fuel infrastructure. So we really need to be up there in Albany and New York City pushing back and giving them information that's based on facts and science. How can our listeners get involved in policy change to help mitigate the climate crisis? There's tons of resources out there. I think, you know, being active on Twitter, there's some great Twitter handles that often post really fascinating, interesting, and educational pieces. And we actually, or Justice, our team just started a new campaign called Right to Zero NY that really focuses on zero emissions, the right to breathe. And you can also find more information on our website, earthjustice.org slash action. A lot of our press releases, recent cases, ways to get involved are also posted there. And then just with really trying to prioritize and ensure that NY Heat Act gets passed, as well as the All Electric Building Act, you know, I really encourage everyone to call their state senator and to speak with their state assembly member and really talk to them about why this is important and what they expect from them and that this is the direction that New York State needs to move in and that New York State should be the leader of the nation. And I think that if state senators as well as assembly folks receive a lot of information, I think that, you know, they want to make sure that they're respecting their constituents and acting on what they want. The methodical, often it takes time, fight. Right. But never giving up, never resting, and often always pushing forward, trying to stay positive, being supportive to everybody, and and knowing that everyone is there for the long fight. Megan, I just feel your desire for climate justice. What can you say to us all that will help us meet these needs? I think it's never giving up, volunteer if you have the time, call your representatives if you have the time, make sure to really question and think critically about the information that's given to you about our climate future. I think, you know, we need to be careful about how utilities and industry can weasel their way in and feed us misinformation and really create some fear and know that in order to have a safe and healthy environment for our children and for our families and our loved ones, we really need to transition off of the gas system and we need to decarbonize the buildings. We need to roll out and have all of our buildings be all electric to make sure that our future is going to be safe. Thank you so much for being here and for your vital work that you're doing. Thank you so much for having me. It's really been an honor. That's it for this episode of Climate Check, Stories and Solutions. Thanks for listening. To subscribe, go to climatecheck.fm. Climate Check is a production of 350 Brooklyn in Brooklyn, New York. Stay up to date with our releases by following 350 Brooklyn on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube. Our production team is Alyssa Kropp, Barbara Schroeder, Bryn Fuller-Becker, that's me, Eva Dean, Peter Kamali, and George Ostro. The music you heard in this episode is from Blue Dot Sessions. 350 Brooklyn is a local affiliate of 350.org, a 
worldwide grassroots climate organization. Join us in finding solutions to counter climate change.